By the terms of APA Section 553, the notice and comment rulemaking process begins with the publication of a notice of proposed rulemaking in the Federal Register. The APA requires nothing at all by way of preparation for this posting. And the posting of a notice of proposed rulemaking is not a final agency action within the meaning of the APA. The notice itself is reviewable only if and when a final rule is promulgated. If no final rule is promulgated, there is no judicial review whatsoever of the posting of a notice of proposed rulemaking. That should give us pause, since the mere notice of a proposed rulemaking could have serious adverses, adverse consequences for someone. If, for example, an agency posted a notice of, proposed, of a proposed rule affecting something you and I make and sell, we might have trouble getting a bank loan to make and sell that thing. The notice could spell our financial ruin. Nonetheless, we get judicial review of the legality of the notice only if and when a final rule eventuates, if we are still in business. And even then, the final rule will not be set aside on the ground that the act of issuing the notice was arbitrary or capricious or otherwise contrary to law. But we may possibly get the final rule set aside if the notice of proposed rulemaking is legally inadequate. What an inadequate notice might look like is illustrated in our next case. Chocolate Manufacturers v. Block, a Fourth Circuit case. The Chocolate Manufacturers is a trade association that lobbies and litigates to promote the interests of the chocolate industry. Who, you might be wondering, could possibly be against chocolate? Well, that's not the issue. The USDA, the Department of Agriculture, subsidizes foods to supplement the diets of impoverished mothers, infants, and young children. The USDA's practice had been to subsidize packages containing flavored milk, mostly chocolate milk, except in the case of infants, taking candy from the baby, so to speak. But then Congress passed legislation directing the USDA to limit subsidies to foods known to science to be nutritious but lacking in the diets of the poor. The statute read, Supplemental foods are those foods containing nutrients determined by nutritional research to be lacking in the diets of pregnant, breastfeeding, and postpartum women, infants, and children. The Secretary shall prescribe by regulation supplemental foods to be made available in the program to the degree possible, the secretary shall assure that the fat, sugar, and salt content of the prescribed foods is appropriate. Notice that Congress specifically directs the USDA to scrutinize sugar content. In response, the USDA published in the Federal Register a notice of proposed rulemaking which cited, which cited this statute as its legal basis. Now, this legislation and the USDA's notice of proposed rulemaking must have made the sugar manufacturers unhappy. They stood to lose a subsidized market for their product. But what has sugar got to do with chocolate? The USDA had been buying chocolate milk for the poor. But what is chocolate milk? Well, it's milk, which is rich in nutrients lacking in the diet of poor people with the addition of chocolate, which has nutritional value too. Is this all there is to chocolate milk? Well, no. Ever bite into a bar of Baker's chocolate? Chocolate milk is sugared milk, flavored with chocolate. Now, of course, the USDA knew this. Didn't the chocolate manufacturers? Could the chocolate manufacturers have been surprised that the USDA's proposed rulemaking could affect a subsidized market for their product? The Chocolate Manufacturers Association is a K Street lobbying organization. It exists for the purpose of scouting out possible opportunities and dangers in Washington. This is downtown the swamp. The proposed rule would have continued subsidizing flavored milk, but during the comment period, unsurprisingly, the USDA read hundreds of objections to continuing this taxpayer subsidy. 
so the USDA's final rule ended it. The chocolate manufacturers took the USDA to court in the Fourth Circuit. A panel of the Fourth Circuit set aside the USDA rule, not that it was arbitrary or capricious, but on the ground that the rulemaking was procedurally defective. Let's look more closely at what APA Section 553 requires. Section 553 Rulemaking General notice of proposed rulemaking shall be published in the Federal Register. The notice shall include reference to the legal authority under which the rule is proposed and either the terms or substance of the proposed rule or a description of the issues and subjects involved. A description of the subjects and issues involved. The USDA's notice did not have to recite the text of the final rule. It merely had to describe the subjects and issues, which it did. The point of the notice requirement is to invite comments. After notice, the agency shall give interested persons an opportunity to participate in the rulemaking through the submission of written data, views, or arguments. After consideration of the relevant material presented, the agency shall incorporate in the rules adopted a concise general statement of their basis and purpose. In brief, notice and comment rulemaking involves notice of the terms or substance or subjects and issues of the rule, opportunity to participate, and a concise general statement of the rule's basis and purpose. The issue in chocolate manufacturers is whether the USDA's notice was legally adequate. The notice did not state that the flavored milk subsidy was to end. It did not need to. The Fourth Circuit acknowledges that the final rule may even be the exact reverse of what was in a proposed rule. It looks to precedent and applies the so-called logical outgrowth test. A notice is legally adequate if the final rule is a logical outgrowth of the notice. The court immediately concedes that the final rule was an outgrowth, but it finds it not easy to answer whether the outgrowth was logical. By asking whether the outgrowth was logical, the court is not asking whether the final rule was arbitrary or capricious, as it surely was not. What is it asking, then? The court frames the issue not in terms of logic, but in terms of whether parties were alerted to the possible consequences of the rulemaking. In general, an approval of a practice in a proposed rule may properly alert interested parties that the practice may be disapproved in the final rule in the event of adverse comments. A notice stating that something will be approved may well avert parties of its possible non-approval on a final rule. One would think this to be especially so where the practice in question is the taxpayer subsidy of sugar consumption. But the court stops talking about the likely effect and highlights what was a possible effect. The total effect of the history of the use of flavored milk, the preamble discussion, and the proposed rule, however, could have led interested persons only to conclude that a change in flavored milk would not be considered. The chocolate manufacturers could have thought the USD had decided to ignore the sugar content of chocolate milk, even in the face of adverse comments and despite Congress's specific charge to the agency to scrutinize sugar content. A cynical observer might say that the Fourth Circuit had transformed the logical outgrowth test into a magical thinking test. A notice is not legally adequate if a party might magically think it could continue to receive an unjustifiable public subsidy. But I, speaking only for myself, could not possibly comment. Whatever else the chocolate manufacturers might have thought, they might have calculated that it was unwise of them to comment on the proposal at all. What little that might be said in favor of sugaring up milk to get young children to drink it would likely have served only to have drawn attention to the issue and deprive the chocolate manufacturers of what turned out to be their best, perhaps their only chance of having the rule set aside on judicial review. And this is worth thinking about. 
One result if the Sweetened Beverages Association were the plaintiff. If the total effect of the notice was to lull the Chocolate Manufacturers Association, why couldn't it have lulled the Sweetened Beverages Association too? Bear in mind that the Fourth Circuit frames the issue not in terms of whether the plaintiff in fact believed sugared milk would keep its subsidy, but whether it could have concluded that the subsidy would be continued despite Congress's direction to the USDA and adverse comments from nutritionists. On remand, the USDA had to re-notice the rulemaking and await further comments. Of course, it was free to promulgate the final rule again in identical form. The chocolate manufacturers had only won some time. Congress had evidently been alarmed by the health consequences of poor nutrition, and we should ask, on remand, could the USD forego notice and comment and simply republish the final rule? That would be cheeky, but would it be illegal? The APA makes an exception we should be aware of. Section 553BB. Rulemaking requirements do not apply when the agency for good cause finds that notice and public procedure thereon are impracticable, unnecessary, or contrary to the public interest. If there is a genuine health emergency, the USDA could simply promulgate a final rule effective immediately. The rule would be judicially reviewable, of course, to determine whether the finding of good cause was arbitrary or capricious. Which it might or might not have been. The percentage of all U.S. children who count as obese was already increasing at an alarming rate by the early 1980s, especially among the impoverished. In the case of Long Island Care at Home versus Coke, the U.S. Supreme Court offered its own gloss on the logical outgrowth test. In the case, the proposed rule would have given caregivers employed by agencies overtime pay. The final rule did not. A unanimous court upheld the notice as adequate as a logical outgrowth of the proposed rule. Since the proposed rule was simply a proposal, its presence meant that the department was considering the matter. After that consideration, the department might choose to adopt the proposal or to withdraw it. We do not understand why such a possibility was not reasonably foreseeable. The court adopts a reasonable foreseeability test rather than the Fourth Circuit's could have mistakenly assumed reading. The court unlike the Fourth Circuit and chocolate manufacturers, did not reward wishful thinking. In addition to satisfying the logical outgrowth test, a legally adequate notice of proposed rulemaking has got to disclose data that the agency intends to rely on. This was one aspect of the holding in the influential Second Circuit case, U.S. versus Nova Scotia Food Products. To suppress meaningful comment by failure to disclose the basic data relied upon is akin to rejecting comment altogether. The Nova Scotia Food Opinion is careful to make clear that a legally adequate notice of proposed rulemaking needn't include the kitchen sink, but APA Section 553's notice requirement is not satisfied unless parties are invited to comment upon the factual basis for the agency's decision to propose to rulemake. In our next installment, we will turn to another aspect of the Nova Scotia food case.